ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. My name is Valerie and I'm from the NUS Office of Alumni Relations. Thank you for being a part of You Alive Today, a platform to showcase the many outstanding members of the NUS community who are championing causes that will make this a better world. The program today is divided into three sections, a 10-minute talk by our speaker, Mr. Alvin Yap, a 10-minute interview with Mr. Viswasada Sivan, chairman of the You Alive Organizing Committee, and then a 40-minute Q&A session. If you wish to ask a question, please make your way to the microphones placed along the aisles and speak directly into them. This is so the online community is able to hear your question. Thank you for your kind attendance and sit back and enjoy. We are a global university. We have a global vision. We recruit students and faculty from around the world. We give them opportunities to learn how to be effective in many cross-cultural settings. And we do this by creating a very diverse environment in NUS. And when people from outside look at the university community, what they see are very rigorously educated individuals who do well in their work. But you know, there are so many universities that are catching up today. And we need to look for a differentiating factor. We must have strong heart. Um, we must go beyond just mainly uh, academic excellence. Not what the university does and does well, but what the university stands for. And that is the, the passion of the community. Students, faculty, staff and alumni, the spirit of the explorer. Somebody who is mentally curious, who has got initiative, resourcefulness, willing to break new ground, which requires boldness, uh, and yet is uh, somebody who is uh, prepared to do something different, to make a contribution. NUS needs to be seen as an organization that is the nurturing ground for people with great passion and the will to go out there and make a difference to their society. And that's what underscores you alive. University that's alive. Where we have members of the NUS community share their passion and their commitment and their contributions in many diverse fields. To share their achievements, to share what they have gone through in their life with the student and the graduate community. Could have been a student. He, he or she could have been or is a teacher, a faculty, could even be an employee, a staff member, or most importantly, an alumni. Individuals who have committed themselves to do very interesting and different things in many varied aspects and dimensions of uh, sports, arts, culture, community service, academic work, and what distinguishes them is a great passion that they bring to their work. The speaker speak for 10 minutes about not so much what he does, but why he does it. What sort of trials and tribulations has he faced? Why does he believe in this? And after that, there will be a question and answer, an interview, a fairly tough interview. Following that, there will be a live question and answer session with an audience comprising about 100 people. You Alive will be in three different dimensions. One, in the auditorium, right, in front of a live audience. While that's going on, it will be carried live via webcam to the student population on campus. And the students can actually interact live while they're watching it. The third dimension is we're going to be pumping it to linked uh, websites, 
with more than 200 universities, some of the top universities in the world. There's another very important dimension to ULI, and that is it's mainly driven by our alumni. The whole idea is to provoke thought, ignite that latent flame that I believe strongly exists in each one of us. There are many things in life that will catch your eyes, but few will catch your heart. And only when you pursue something that you are passionate about, can you achieve greater heights. And to make even more distinctive contributions to the society we live in and to the wider world beyond. You Alive will epitomize that. Passion, action, inspiration. You Alive. There is no formal structure for deaf education in Timor. So, particularly all my students had never attended school before. They don't quite have a language of their own, no oral language, for example. Language is the very basic, it's a foundation of human learning. So, if they don't have language, that means they are not really part of human community. When I first came in, there were 16 students all in one class. Their ages ranged from 8 to 52. So it was quite tough. I started with the basics. For example, uh, science for family, for food, for animals. So I link the word with the sign and then I did a video and then put it all together in a slideshow. School is still going, is still running. So uh, four of the more senior students have become teachers. Be before I left, I helped to train them. They're helping to teach the younger students, the new students. I felt it was something I could do. And I knew I had the experience and qualifications. Uh, so I thought, why not? What do I have to lose? Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming down here to hear about my life story, or at least one year of it. Uh, I'm sure you know um, about my trip to Timor from the publicity materials. Okay, so um, let me start off first by touching upon it briefly about my one year there and what I did in Dili, the capital. Uh, I was a teacher with a Kapi school for the deaf in Dili. Of course, I think uh, there were many adventures and things that happened to me while I was there. But what I want to talk about is uh, my time with the school and um, what I did there. Okay, uh, generally, uh, I helped to develop a sign language system for the deaf students in the school, as well as um, draw up a syllabus for the, for the students. Um, OK, the life there was quite different from what I was used to in Singapore. As you can see from the photos, daily days and nights. The nights were very different when you have a lot of backouts and water cards. OK, now, so why did I go all the way to Delhi, to volunteer. So I think this is what most of you want to know. Why did I choose to go to Timor to volunteer? What was my reasons? First of all, it was because I know I had the experience 
and expertise because I was a teacher for the deaf before in Singapore for four years. So when this opening came up, of course, uh, I knew I could do it and I was interested. You can see uh, this is a, the school when I first joined, when I went over, there were about 16 students. When I left, there was about 25 students. That was one year ago. Now, I, I went back there um, in March. That was two years after I first went to the school. There are now over 50 students, but I cannot take the credit for the increase, of course. Some of the scenes, uh, school life. Okay, this is the most recent uh, photo I took just two months back. Okay, so why volunteer? Why bother to spend one year uh, in Delhi? I think if you ask volunteers why they want to volunteer, you get a lot of reasons. I remember when I first applied for this assignment and was interviewed by the country manager of SIF, the Singapore International Foundation. I gave all the usual reasons. I'm sure you can guess why. When he asked me, why do you want to volunteer? Why do you want to take up this assignment? I gave all the expected reasons, like uh, I want to make a difference. Um, I want to help others because I can. And I want to do something meaningful. Okay. Of course, uh, I also say I want to see more of the world, experience life in a different country, things like that. But after that, I, when I think further about it, I realise these are not really the real reasons or not the whole story. Um, I would say, of course, it's true that I want to do something meaningful because I want to help um, the deaf students in Delhi. That's all true, but uh, I, will, I think when it comes to volunteering, personal reasons are the most important. And most of the time, these are something which is difficult to explain. It must come from within. All of us have our own reasons for volunteering. And sometimes the reasons can be selfish ones. But um, I feel that as long as your intentions are good, why not? I remember uh, before I left, for Dili, uh, many of my friends, when they come to know about it, they, they tell me, are you sure? And say things like, uh, will it be dangerous there? And would your family be worried about you? Then a few months later, after I was in Dili, uh, and start emailing back uh, accounts of my life there, they, they, they start saying things like, wow, you are so inspiring totally change. Wow, mm, you're doing very good work there. So, um, but for me, it's very puzzling actually, I, because I don't think I'm inspiring. I know for many of us in Singapore, if you, tell, if you intend to spend one year overseas volunteering, then it is a big deal because it's not very common, it's not very usual. But um, if you think about it, one year is not a very long time. If I say, uh, why not you spend one year in Europe or in Japan or in Australia, maybe on a student exchange program, nobody will say, wow, you are very inspiring. Why is that so? I think um, when I 
when I think about um, when I think about uh, the reasons, I ask myself why not. I have many reasons in mind already. It may be dangerous there. I lose one year of income, for example, and um, it's a it's a developing country, very different from Singapore. I will lower my standard of living, things like that. But in the end, I realized that uh, these are not something that will really stop me if I want to. I, because I believe that uh, we have to do something that is larger than ourselves. Sometimes, because I've lived in Singapore all my life, uh, I'm now 35 years old. Before I left, I was in, I've lived all my life in Singapore, 32 years old. Life here is very comfortable, that's true for most of us, and very stable. Uh, but in the end, you realize that um, sometimes you want to do something that really impacts on others, that makes a difference. And of course, I have my own personal reasons as well, like, but these are personal reasons. So uh, I will I look at it from a different perspective. I ask myself, why not? In the sense that, why not? If I can, why not? What do I have to lose? Uh, but after I went, I realized I gained a lot. Especially uh, when I see how my students benefited how eager they were to learn, and how much they enjoy learning and having a place, a school to call their own. Things like that, you cannot really, uh, you cannot really uh, expect or understand before you go. You have to try, and then where after you try, you realize that there's a lot to gain. So if you ask me why volunteer, I will ask you why not. And I'm sure you have a lot of reasons why not. But if you really want to, then you have to come from within you. And then mm, you will see that uh, when you can make a difference, when life is more about myself, about me, my family, my friends, it becomes more meaningful. And volunteering, helping others, is not something noble, but something which do for yourself, which uh, makes your life better in many ways. So, uh, one last point. Hey, talk about inspiring. You see the lady in red, in pink and blue in the middle. They have been in Delhi for four years. They run a school there. From they started from scratch. So, if you ask them why they volunteer, why they uh, spend four years in Delhi, then they will tell you the same thing. Why not? We want to. And they are my inspirations. So I hope um, uh, we can all reflect on what volunteering is and what it means to us. It will have a different meaning for everyone. And I hope you find yours. Thank you. Alvin, the, I couldn't help noticing or realizing how many times you said, why not? Uh, I counted, it was eight. <laughs> eight times you said, why not? Why not? And uh, it got me thinking because I guess what you're trying to say is in our society, uh, we often ask why a lot more times. Uh, maybe not just our society, but in a lot of societies. We come up with reasons why we shouldn't do it, as opposed to why not. 
Is that what you're trying to communicate? Is that what you're trying to share with us? Uh, I feel that when we ask people why they do something, uh, we are expecting to explain the reasons, uh, their motivations. When I talk about, when I ask why not, I'm actually asking myself and maybe others what who stand back, what are their fears, what are the worries that stop them from doing what they want to do. Uh, yeah. So I guess uh, that is why I ask why not. Uh, it's also asking myself, actually, I'm asking myself what, what is holding me back. I, I kind of sense that as well because um, I have found myself asking that question increasingly. Why not? Because many of us talk, think, but very few of us actually go out there and do it. And uh, those, from my experience, those who actually do it are those who ask the why not question. And so you're right. The why not question very often is more rhetorical is we are asking ourselves why not to persuade ourselves that it is not something that's wrong. It's not something we shouldn't do, you know. And, and in line with that, if I could ask you a question. Recently, a friend of mine told me this very interesting thing. He said, uh, there is no such thing as altruism. There's no such thing as altruism, you know. I mean, altruism, we are talking about you know, we are doing it to improve another person's life. How many of you think, just how many of you think you agree with this friend of mine, that there's no such thing as altruism? His point is, when you go out there to help someone, like you did in Timor Leste, you are actually getting twice or three times as much back, but perhaps in a different sense. So it's not really that you're sacrificing you're doing it consciously because you've asked yourself, why not? And I noticed that you kept repeating that just now, you know. I am doing it because I am gaining something. For me, that was refreshing honesty. Because many of us like the idea of doing something because it sounds good. But I found what you said refreshing and authentic because... You said it as it is. I did it because I wanted to get something out of it. It's not often that you hear that, right? It's humbling, and I appreciate that. Uh, I would say that's quite true. I think many of us uh, are not that noble or kind as to go all out for a cause. There are people like that, but they are very, very rare. No, not all of us are, let's say, Mother Thursday, for example. So, uh, so when we do things, especially when it comes to charity or uh, volunteer work, um, we will, of course, say we want to help others. But I think what motivates many volunteers is the, what they gain from helping it's not material things, of course. Mostly it's the, uh, how good it makes you feel. It's more of, uh, it's something more abstract. You feel a lot better about yourself, for one. <laughs> and you feel that you are really doing something useful. So, can, can you share a little bit of that <coughs> for, for those of us who may not have volunteered? What is that, that reward that you got in Delhi? What, what was that reward? That, can you illustrate it? Okay, uh, for example, uh, when I went over, when I was uh, a KPA school for the deaf in Delhi, uh, I had students, most of my students, you can say all my students, had no chance to go to school before. They were totally uneducated. Their ages range from 8 to 52. Some of them learn to write their ABCs and count their 1, 2, 3s for the first time. And that 
you can see they are not they are intelligent. It's just that they never had a chance to attend school because of their deafness. So when you see the pressure they get from being able to write their name or being able to count, understand the concept of numbers, when you see how much they enjoy the process of learning, then you know, that is my reward. It's not, it's not something concrete, more abstract. But for me, I consider it a privilege and a pleasure. Elvin, can you share with us one or two stories or anecdotes of conversations that you may have had with your students that gave you a sense of how you may have touched lives? I'm sure there were many such uh, Because uh, I was a teacher, so most of the time, uh, my work is in the academic setting. Uh, yeah, those in the classroom. Um, I think, uh, let me see. Ah, when I first joined the school, most of the students had their own homemade science, a lot of different science. Uh, they make up by themselves, not standardized. So when they want to, uh, when I ask them, what is your sign for helicopter? Because there were frequent helicopter yeah. flights over the capital, the UN people especially. So some of them say like helicopter, like that. some of them just point to the sky. But of course, it's very hard to understand what they mean. You point to the sky, it can be a bird, or you can be the cloud. So I. I teach them a standardized sign, which spread very fast because it's very clear and very obvious, it's helicopter. Mm. So things like that help them to communicate better. You can see the level of their, and standard of their communication among themselves improve a lot, as well as with their family, especially for those who learn how to spell, write and spell the word for helicopter in the tomb, their own language, uh, which I've forgotten now. Yeah, but uh, to me, uh, that shows uh, something very uh, concrete uh, in how uh, they benefited. Elvin, let me ask you something about yourself. <clears throat> you lost your hearing when you were eight years old, which is the reason why you are able to speak, correct? Uh, because you were able to sp yeah, I was, speak before uh, you lost your I'm hearing. I'm considered as... Uh, uh, one of those, uh, I, I learned, I pick up speech before I lost my hearing. That's why my speech is so clear. Uh, this is uh, also for those who are born deaf or lose their hearing before they learn speech. Of course, uh, you, their speech is more difficult to understand. Yes. So, yeah. Now, can you share with us how you felt when you lost something as precious as hearing? How did you feel at the age of eight when you lost it? Uh, you mean when I lose my hearing, hearing yeah. ability? Uh, at that time, I was, I was quite young. So uh, I remember that I have a lot of problems in a classroom, even then understanding teachers, because my hearing was not that great. Uh, but I don't have any great impression of how I feel other than that I hated my hearing aids. I refused to wear them. Uh, but of course, uh, it is not really what I feel about my hearing loss, but how it impacts on my social life mm. and my agitation. That, uh, that is more important. So, uh, so how did it affect your social life and your education? Okay, my hearing loss is uh, my hearing loss is in the frequency, in the human speech frequency range. So, in other words, uh, I have never ever understand understood what my teachers say in a classroom, from primary school all the way to university. Except for one day in primary six, when my teacher, when form teacher used a mic, because her voice, uh, she had some voice problems, so she used a mic microphone. 
and the transmitter was placed right to my desk. That was the only year I could understand my teacher. <laughs> Maybe that's a blessing. <laughs> the rest <laughs> of the time, no. So I like to say that uh, I don't learn really learn anything from my teachers. I depend a lot on self-study, which is tough, even at the best of times, which is very tough. And of course, for social life, the same things happens. If you cannot hear, you cannot understand what people are saying, then of course, uh, things is very hard for you to interact and mix with your peers. I remember what Helen Keller Helen said Keller. about hearing loss, the blind and deaf lady. Blindness separates you from things. Deafness separates you from people because of communication barrier. So that's how uh, my deafness has affected me. So how much of what you have experienced in terms of how deafness has separated you from people been a, a reason for you to try and help others, right? Gain the capacity to communicate, like in Delhi. And you plan to do a lot more of that in Indochina, right? Uh, yes, I would say that because I understand uh, how those who are, as we say, less privileged, less fortunate. Because in some ways, uh, I've been through the same thing. So especially because, uh, especially regarding deaf students, deaf people, I have deafness myself. So I understand the challenges, the problems, and the difficulties they face. So um, of course, um, that you can say that is one reason which motivates me to do something for them. And of course, you can say it's doing something for myself as well. Yeah. But I will, but I'm more, I would like to think I'm more of an advocate for people with disabilities, not just deaf people alone. So, uh, so in that sense, my own disability has made me more, I think, more open-minded in that sense, mm. because when you experience something for yourself, then it's easier to relate and to uh, relate to others with the same issues. I'd like to ask you one, one final question before I throw it open to the floor. <clears throat> Recently, there has been quite a bit of debate in Singapore about um, whether children with special needs should be in a special needs school like Pathlight, or is it better to get them to be in normal schools with regular children, without special needs. It's an ongoing debate, right? Now, there are people who are critical of the Pathlight School experiment. But those who advocate the Pathlight School, which is a school designed and run for special needs children, say that that has helped these special needs children grow in confidence. Right? The, the reality is we don't have, we don't seem to have enough teachers trained to handle children with special needs. You know, people like Dennis Poir, the, uh, man, uh, the MP who started Pathlight School, is arguing that, you know, let's be realistic about it. If you send a child with special needs to a normal school, you don't have enough teachers who can handle them. On the other hand, if you continue in a, a special needs school, then when you come out of school and get into the real world, can you then relate enough, well enough, with children who don't have special needs? I think that's the one good. So I'd like to hear your view on that. Okay, let me put it this way. Uh, I was a special education teacher before. So, in sorry, the couple of sorry, there, what does that mean? Uh, special uh, I was, uh, I was, a, I worked with special needs children. In this case, deaf children. So, all special schools in Singapore are run by VWOs. The VWOs are funded by MCYS, NCSS, and MOE. Half, half. The many helping hands approach. Right. 
So, sorry, and what sort of training did you undergo before you could be a special needs teacher? Uh, when I when I joined the Singapore School for the Deaf, uh, I was an untrained teacher. So it's on the job training part. I, at the first available opening, I had to register and attend the diploma in special education course at NIE. Okay. Uh, that was a two-year part-time course. So every day, uh, from morning until one, I was in school teaching. Then 2.30 onwards, I would rush all the way to NIE to attend lectures for my diploma course. Uh. So what is your view about the question I asked? Okay, I feel that uh, because of my background, I, can, I think I have um, better understanding of the issues. Uh, okay, let me put it this way. I have friends who are in mainstream schools, MOE teachers. So I can compare if MOE is willing to pay to take in uh, special schools under its wing. Now, special schools are not under MOE. They are separate. Special education teachers are not MOE teachers. They are not civil servants. Mm, mm. They are, so when you look at the pay, the social status, the benefits, the career path, it's very, very wild. So in the first place, we say we don't have enough teachers to handle special needs children. Why is that so? One big reason would be because the career prospects are not quite there. So that's a very big gap. Hmm. So uh, I would say that if there is more commitment in terms of financial support, uh, systematic, uh, uh, structural support for special needs schools, then this is something that be, uh, can be overcome uh, in terms of uh, getting enough teachers. Um, in, in the mainstream schools? Um, I would say uh, there, there is always a place for special schools, especially for those with severe disabilities, okay. Uh, okay. which are very difficult to integrate the mainstream environment. But um, I think MOE has recently, in, in recent years, they have tried to put as many special needs students as possible in mainstream schools. But those are more um, not so serious cases. Mm, mm. For example, autism, mm. students with autism, if the case is not that serious, sure, you can go to mainstream school. We have support them. But if it's moderate to severe, then the only, then mainstream schools will not accept. Then the only way is special schools. So uh, I would say there can be more effort made to mainstream uh, more special needs students. There is always a place for special schools for very serious cases, severe cases. But I would say for a majority, even those with intellectual disabilities, those with blindness, those with deafness and those with autism, <coughs> they can be mainstream. Mm. So the, the, what is the issue here? It's more about manpower, the quality and number of teachers. Uh, one way to solve it is, of course, to have um, government play a, a bigger part, give more support. So, um, but, and this is something I would say the special needs community has been fighting for, for many years. It's not something new, it's an old issue. I think from the 1970s or 80s, we, they have been saying, uh, let's recognize special schools as MOE schools. But so far, this has not happened. And this is what I hope to see in future. Are you optimistic? Uh, there, there has been some encouraging moves towards this uh, in recent years, but I remember very, one very interesting incident. Uh, that was about, let me see, six, seven years ago when I first joined the diploma in special education course. The lecturer asked us, most of us were mid-career converts, mm. uh, 
Uh, they, but, but they have been working in special suits for about one year plus. They ask, the lecturer asked us, uh, do you think, do you think do, are you optimistic that uh, special, special schools will finally be accepted into MOE? Most of, them, most of us say, not in our lifetime. <laughs> so, but, but since then, there, as I said, there has been many encouraging moves. So I'm hoping to see it within my lifetime. That's a good point for us to throw it open to the floor. <coughs> if I could use my power as a, as a moderator to ask Swanim, my wonderful lady friend. Uh, Swanim, you were a princip the principal of Mount Vernon primary, secondary. secondary. And uh, you want to share with us, Swanim, uh, your experience, because that was the first school, MOE school in Singapore, that took in special needs students, right? In the 1970s? Okay, you want to share with us? Thank you. Swanim, your mic is here. You can face all of us. You can keep ro rounding. <laughs> yes. Uh, in the 1970s, I was the principal of Mount Vernon. And in those days... Sorry, can you hear her? Good. Thank can you, you all hear me? Yes. In those days, Mount Vernon was the only secondary school uh, with MOE's uh, full support that took in secondary students who are hearing impaired. In the primary Sorry, school... Sorry, Swani. Could you stand there okay. so that the audience can see you? Yeah, thank you. Um, in the primary school, uh, the he we call them hearing impaired, H-I-P. H-I-P uh, students were in Kenosan Convent in those days. And when they finish primary school, they would be sent to Mount Vernon. I remember I was a little taken aback when I was told uh, these students will be integrated with the mainstream students and we will treat them just like one of us. So, say, of 40, I would have uh, five attending Sec 1 together with my normal Sec 1 students, uh, another six or seven Sec 2. So they were actually spread among my students in an ordinary classroom. And uh, Sorry, uh, what sort of disabilities did the children have? Uh, the HIV, hearing impaired. All of them were HIV? All of them. Various degrees of impairment, but most of them would not be able to hear. Even, I think they couldn't <coughs> even speak. Okay. I remember they, they, they couldn't even speak. So I asked my teachers, uh, in fact, I worked very closely uh, with the Association for the Deaf. Uh, at that time, it was in Mountbatten Road. Uh, that was so many years ago. I do not know what is the status now. I mean, I retired so many years ago. Uh, I, I really wouldn't know, but I will be sharing with you what happened in the 1970s. And uh, my teachers would come to me and say, uh, they are having a problem. Half the time, most of the time, those students wouldn't understand what they were teaching. I was given, I discussed my problem with MOE, and I was given three resource teachers. We call them resource teachers. I remember Mr. Lim Chin Heng. I think Alvin was says, Alvin's teacher. Uh, was. Mr. Lim Chin Heng, in those days, uh, he was born uh, totally HIP, but uh, fortunate enough, to be sent by his parents at a very early age to the United States. And he returned with a degree. In, uh, 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 a, a degree. Uh, a bachelor regular, of regular arts subject. Or, bachelor of arts or whatever. And uh, he was paid, I think, an, I think he had a master's degree. Uh, that that uh, I, I cannot remember the name, but it was a very famous university in the United States, especially for hearing in bad people. Oh, I know, I cannot remember the name of the unit. I remember Prof. Tommy Ko was very impressed. Uh, she invited us, she invited Lim Chin Heng uh, to, to find out more about the, the HIV students. 
Anyway, Chin Heng, I remembered, was paid an honest degree salary by MOE. He was treated just like any... Uh, so he was a uh, uh, fully trained teacher. And with the MOE sent two other teachers. They would be ordinary mainstream teachers, say conduct from the secondary schools, after they have been with the association for the deaf through a certain course, they knew and they could teach sign language. So after lessons, see, the students would attend the normal lessons in class. And after lessons, they would adjourn to a special room. I allocated a special room for them. <coughs> and they would meet the three resource teachers, Chin Heng, and uh, the other two, I remember it was Barbara Jesus. I, I do not know where she is now. And uh, there, the students would get help from these teachers. I remember uh, 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 I couldn't communicate with them. I should have learned some sign language, but I didn't, regrettably, I did not learn enough sign language to communicate with them. But I issued all of them, uh, not the tablets that we, but it's called a writing tablet. Uh, I, I do not know what you call it today. Not, not that nice tablet you're talking about. A, a writing tablet and uh, 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 with a pen. So when they see me, they would write, good morning. Yes. <laughs> they would write. Uh, some of them tried to articulate, but uh, most of them were not able to communicate. Well. So Swanim, l l yes. let me ask you this question, yes. because we, we, I want to go back to him. Uh. Let me ask you this question. Um, do you think it worked, that experiment? Uh, What's your conclusion? Do you think it worked? When I left Mount Vernon after five years to go to Tomasic Secretary, uh, I would not have any idea what happened after I left. But I was told that the Association for the Deaf increasingly took over the management of this program. Um, it was an experiment to integrate hearing impaired into mainstream schools. In so far as uh, the students in my school accepted them, they were not uh, boycotted. I mean, right. They were accepted mm -hmm. by the students. But they kept mostly to themselves. As a small community of about 40, I remember my excitement when one of them did well enough in all levels to qualify for poly. And he graduated from Poly. I remember we were all very, very excited when he came back to the school after he graduated from Poly. Uh, these students, during weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, would go to Mountbatten Road to the Association for Their Hearing and Impact. And there, uh, they uh, uh, received further support and uh, uh, help. Uh, if you ask me, did it work? I would say for the time I was there, the five years I was in Mount Vernon, um, I had to give a report every year to the Association for the Deaf, how the, what the progress of the students and all that. Um, I would say it was a very brave experiment. It was a very brave experiment. Uh, if it worked, I mean, whether it worked or not, it gave an opportunity for hearing impaired students to be accepted huh, and to integrate with mainstream students. How, uh, whether they felt uh, uh, shortchanged, I, I really wouldn't know. But uh, three resource teachers together with the other teachers for 40 students, and I was given uh, a special budget uh, to support them, for an example, uh, uh, they communicated with, in those days we didn't have handphones, so it was a pager, mm. huh? pager. And uh, 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 when the pager, they were able to communicate uh, with each other with the, the pager. I, I remember that very well. And uh, they could play games. I remember seeing them playing basketball with my students. Yep. Uh, I like to think that uh, they were happy in the school. 
I like to think that at no point did they feel, why did MOE send them to that school? Why can't they have a special school of that? I like to think that. Subsequently, on weekends sometimes, I would be invited to the association in Mountbatten Road. And uh, 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 I would be told uh, stories of how well some of them have done in life. In fact, uh, two or three, okay. that was so many years ago, by now I would have done very, very well in so, the polytechnics. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Swani. I'll, I'll now put, to put that comment to uh, Elvin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Elvin, you uh, heard what Swanim okay. said. Uh, this was in the 1970s, late 70s. How far do you think we have come as a society in this, in this aspect? Uh, okay, first, thank you, Mem. This is a very interesting uh, historical perspective. Okay, the situation now, from what I, what I know of my ex, from my ex-students and my friends in the deaf community, uh, first, we have to understand that all deaf students are mainstream. Soon or later, there are only two schools for the deaf at primary school level. After yeah. that, there are no specialized schools for the deaf at secondary level and above. So all of them are mainstream. Yeah. So, uh, but the issues now is more to do with support, the amount of support. For example, the deaf student in classroom requires a note taker, mm. especially for those who still cannot hear well despite hearing aids uh, and other technolo te technological devices. They still cannot depend on themselves to understand what the, the teacher or lecturer is saying. So there's a need for them to have note takers or sign language interpreters or even other systems like card, which involves someone typing in whatever is being said and which is projected on the screen. These are standard in Western countries. Yep. Yep. If you go to Australia or America or UK, they the university that will provide this fee of charge. So, but in Singapore, uh, we are lacking all this support. There, there is some form of support in terms of resource teachers, in terms of one-to-one uh, mm, -one remedial classes, mm. uh, things like that. But it's very ad hoc, case by case. So what we need now is a more systematic approach where we, once we have a student who is deaf or has any other disability in the classroom, it should not be up to the school or teacher to say, ah, now what, what shall we do? What can we do? Mm. There mm. must be some kind of procedure. Yep. Like, for example, if uh, for the deaf student, there must be an option for the student to have note taker or sign language interpreter or anything else that helps. It should not be, oh, Let's see if we can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So it should so it not be must be provided. So this is where we have a long way to go. Uh, and this is where we are lacking in terms of support. Mainstreaming or not mainstream is not the case, the issue now, especially for the deaf. They are all mainstream, mainstream. unless the student has other disability, such as uh, intellectual disability yeah. or autism, uh, in which case they do not go to mainstream school. Yeah. But for all other cases, they are in the mainstream schools. So Mm, but where we lag behind is the amount of support that is provided uh, for the deaf students. I think this applies as well to students with other disabilities. Okay. You will find that uh, there is a lot of uh, feedback on uh, how much the school can do for them or the parents have the right to the teachers to ask for more help, things like that. Yeah. Because there is no system in That's place. It's all up to individual school or individual teachers to come up with something. Yeah. So right, what you're saying is right now, help is there, but it is very ad hoc, right? And it's very, yes. very much dependent on the initiative of the principal of the school. And, and for us to move forward, it needs to, be in, it needs to become a structured program that is uniform across the school. Yes. yes? Uh, I'd like to uh, say at this point that Many teachers and many schools have been very helpful. I'm sure 
there are teachers who are willing to go the extra mile, to go the distance for students, students with special needs. But we cannot have, we should not depend on yeah. people's kindness alone. We must have a systematic uh, approach to this. And, and this is where I feel that uh, in terms of uh, uh, official policies and guidelines, uh, which are implemented and enforced, uh, which will go a long way uh, to make things better. Right, thank you. Uh, Val, you want to s explain what you do? Hi, yes. So my name is Valerie, and I'm the online moderator today for You Alive. So while everything's been going on, there have been questions that have been left on the website, and um, I'll just ask them to Alvin now. Okay? So um, our first question comes from a uh, user named Bernice, and I'm going to paraphrase this slightly. So she wants to know what is, what is the difference between someone who is hearing impaired living in Singapore as compared to someone living in a third world country like East Timor? What are the similarities and differences between these two communities in very different countries? Um, I can only speak for Timor, of course, when you talk about developing countries. I would say that in, Timor, in Timor's case, it is the poorest country in Asia and one of the poorest in the world. So conditions are a bit extreme. But uh, why we know Singapore is one of the richest countries in the world. So already in terms of wealth, income level, okay, that's a big difference. And as for how it impacts on uh, deaf people in this, in Singapore and in Timor, I would say that here we have a lot of uh, medical support. Do you, uh, do you know, for example, that there is a universal screening for newborns, which uh, that means all newborn babies will undergo a hearing test uh, to detect hearing loss. There's such a thing now, unless the parent opts out. So, it's, so right from birth, we can detect whether this child has hearing loss. And from there, we can go undergo early intervention programs. And of course, later on, we can fit up the hearing aids, correct implants, uh, go for therapy sessions, things like that. Then, of course, in Timor, there's nothing. When I say nothing, I mean nothing. You go to hospitals, uh, there's no audiologist. There is no speech therapy programs. There is no, there is hearing aids. I think if you can find, somehow find the money to bring them in. So when I went to Timor, and start working in the school, uh, we have to start from scratch, as in start with nothing, then they have to build something from there. So the difference, the main difference I would say in terms of resources, we have resources and we do make use of these uh, resources to um, help our deaf children in Singapore. And as for Timor, I think you know, it will need a lot of external help and if you're asking about differences in deaf people in Singapore and deaf people in Timor, I would say I don't really see the difference hmm. when it comes to, uh, you know, they are all people. I can relate well to my Timor, my students in Dili. They are, you know, after a while, after the initial shyness, you know, yeah, they are just normal children, the normal people to me. But the important is, thing is, I can communicate with them through sign language. Uh, why they are more cut off from the wider society because of the, their deafness. And the same thing happens in Singapore as well. You find that many deaf people here, they are a bit isolated from the wider community because of the communication barrier. Right. Okay. Questions, please, or comments? Anyone? Yes. My name is Tan Si Ping, graduate of the University of Malaya. I have two questions, actually. First one, I want to ask Alvan whether his trip to Timor Leste is because of the challenge. You know, some people like to be challenged. You know, the more difficult it is, the more I want to do it. Because he has been teaching four years in Singapore. So maybe life is getting dull, 
and there's nothing to challenge his innovation, his creativeness, and so on. So he got this opportunity to go to a lesser known country like Timor Leste, and then try to challenge him, particularly the unknown. Remember, people say it's very dangerous to go there. So the more uh, challenging it is, the more he will take the bait, just like, you know, <laughs> fishing. So that's one thing I want to ask him, because he always asks, why not, why not, right? The <laughs> second thing is, for those with some hearing impact and all that, I think the nature provides us to have a compensation. That means if you are hearing impact, but you may have more acuity in your sight or in your thinking or in your handwriting or whatever it is. So is there any compensation in his ability that uh, although he cannot hear, but that will be compensated for by his better speech or better thinking or whatever it is? Can you comment? Sure. Uh, let me address the uh, sec second question first. I think uh, it's actually not that true that deaf people have better eyesight. It's more that they are more visually aware. They, are, they, they tend to notice things that um, others may miss uh, when, uh, visual, visually, uh, especially for body language. Uh, it's very important. And, uh, but compensation, I'm not very sure, but uh, maybe for no, myself. I, I think what he meant is exactly what he mm. just said. Mm. You know, that, that you, you probably need to um, hone a particular skill to compensate for the other one. Uh, so I think it may, be, it may be true in some ways, mm. yeah. So, uh, for example, I know many of my deaf friends are more, more visual people in the arts, in the field of arts, uh, design, photography, things like that. So, yeah, I would say, yeah, in a certain extent, it's true. So, coming to the first question, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a risk taker, actually. I'm your typical kiasu Singaporean, <laughs> you know? I went through the system. I was born in Singapore. <laughs> I grew up in Singapore. I went through the Singapore education system. So uh, I wouldn't say I'm some kind of rebel or non-confirmist. No, I, I'm your typical Singaporean. Uh, in my case, I feel I was, why I choose to go over is because once I list down all the why nots, I realized that these, those are not really big problems. Uh. One year without income, surely we can do it, most of us. Uh, I mean, especially for those who are uh, graduates and have, and have been working for a certain number of years and have some savings. As for the place is dangerous, it is dangerous as I will not have sent me there. They are also your typical Kiasu <laughs> organization. So, and if, in, uh, but even if something happens, I'm sure SIF would pull me out as soon as possible. So once you uh, think about it, more rationally about it, you find that all these dangerous, risky factors are not really the case. So this is how I justify uh, all these research to myself. So, uh, but of course I do feel I do feel that uh, it's a challenge for me, and that is part of the attraction to experience life in a different country and in a developing country. I, I would say if I go to Australia or Japan or Europe, the standard of life there is quite comfortable, and in that sense, it will not be that much different from Singapore. So I would experience, say, my parents' childhood years, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, dusty streets, uh, backouts every day, uh, rats in my room, there, uh, there were rats in my room, and you know, water cars, things like that. Yeah. So uh, I would say it's more like I've experienced something different um, from what I used to. Okay. You had a question, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Sachin. Um, uh, before I come to the question, some background uh, uh, about the question. 
Uh, this, uh, whatever I'm quoting now is about 20 years back. Uh, I was in university at that time uh, and uh, we were a group of uh, volunteers who used to go for teaching young students. Uh, but by the way, we are all normal people and uh, we, we used to teach uh, normal students. My question is, it was uh, an extremely difficult task. By the way, we used to go to a small, uh, uh, this, this story is in India, in Chennai, where I was studying, where I was doing my postgraduate. We used to go to a small place, uh, which was, uh, uh, I mean, people were very poor. And uh, we used to uh, get students for, uh, we used to teach them. So the biggest factor was getting the students to, to be taught. Mm -hmm. So now th th this is where I'm leading to the question that it, how do you convince parents or students to come to your place? That was the biggest inhibition factor which we found. Mm -hmm. So I'm going probably beyond the why not. Mm -hmm. Once you have really entered there, how do you really motivate people or motivate parents, motivate students to come and benefit from the activity that you're trying to do? So that is my question. Um, I found it very, very difficult to really get students there. So I, it is really a commendable task that people in the age from right from 8 to 52 can really come and uh, yeah. attend such classes. If I may add, add, uh, add a comment to that, um, I, I do quite a bit of work with Cinda and uh, the, the similar problem. And I think many VWOs, VWOs face that problem, uh, which is that those who really need help don't come forward. You know, many people who need help uh, could be in denial. They may not want to come forward or they may be embarrassed. Uh, I guess that's what you're driving at. I mean, in many of these societies, even including our society, there are people who really need help. Uh, the parents don't want to send the kids because they feel that will be a loss of face uh, to send the kid. Or the parents feel that the kid will survive. Or worse, the parents feel this is the kid's fate. You know, in Tamil, we say vidhi. Right. That means this is the fate. We have to accept it. Next life, he'll be rewarded. You know. So these are some of the points that I think you are, you are referring to. Did you experience that? I think that's a very common problem, uh, especially the, the face, loose face issue, uh, where parents tend to hide their yeah. children with disabilities or special needs at home. Uh, I had encountered something like that, similar as well, both in Singapore and in Timor. Okay, in Timor, um, but in Timor, the people there that tend to be more open mm. because they are more equal in the sense yes. Yes. that everyone is equally poor. Yeah. So, so, social status is not that big a, a thing issue, as yeah. it is in Singapore, perhaps. And uh, they still have this kampong spirit there. So people look out for each other. So things like deaf, deaf children, uh, if deaf child, I came across one or two cases where the family want to hide the child at home. Mm. Like, uh, oh, we, I remember making home visit to one of these families. Uh, the mother was very, very reluctant to let the child join our school because, you know, face very, she doesn't understand. Uh, the importance of agitation, things like that. Uh, but I would say for the majority, there is no, no such... That is, the problem is not that bad. Most of them are very willing and open, uh, especially when you, they can see that those who are already attending the school benefit. The co deaf community is very small. So in, even in the Many of my deaf students will say, oh, I know someone else in my village or near my village who is also deaf. Uh, uh, I'll talk to him or her, ask, ask him to come down. Uh, some of them will, some of them won't. But that is this feeling of more openness towards people with disabilities. You can see uh, in the capital, you can see people, uh, not wheelchair users, they have this kind of skates kind of yeah. thing which they build, construct themselves with pedals and cycling over the place, you know. Uh, so they may do with what they have. Yeah. You, you can see, you can see that they are, especially those are physically disabled. Those with physical disabilities, uh, they get around in all kinds of ways, you know. As long as there's a wheel, you can fix something onto it, then you can go around 
independently. But of course, there are a lot of obstacles along the way. Uh, so uh, I would say public agitation is important uh -huh. so that people in general are aware of what uh, disability means and why agitation is important. But of course, uh, when, you, when you know that in Timor, uh, that is supposed to be universal primary education, but I think about half the students doesn't get to go to school, mm -hmm. not enough facilities, not enough teachers. So in the end, uh, this issue of... Uh, so in the end, when they, whenever there's an opportunity for them to study, I think a lot of them will grab it. A lot of them will at least try it out. So, uh, whereas you talk, talking about Singapore's case or other places, I would still say public agitation is very important. It's important to reach out yeah. to people, to families with such special needs children and explain to them, mm, uh, don't need to hide your child. Just get your child, calm down. Or those in need, please calm down. We have this kind of uh, services and facilities for you. So, uh, but of course, it's not that simple. But what we can do is to try. Well, thank you, Alvin. And, and we'll have to wrap here. Um, let me, this is not the end of the conversation. We're going to have uh, light refreshments. Feel free to interact with Alvin. And also, um, you may be aware that there's a, an exhibition downstairs of Alvin's photographs. The photographs he took when he was in Delhi. And uh, some of them are fantastic photographs, very personal, and they capture the mood and his experience. And um, he's selling the photographs for uh, $200, I think, per, per, per photograph. And the proceeds will go to charity, to, uh, to, to the proceeds will go to the Agape School in Delhi. Right? It's only $200 per photograph. If you can, it'll be wonderful because it'll help the school for the deaf in Timor-Leste. Right? So we hope that you would, uh, you would be generous if you can. Um, and um, it leaves me now to thank all of you, first of all, for being a very sensitive audience. Uh, even though there weren't that many questions, I think from your expressions I can tell that there's quite a bit of reflection. Uh, that's what I like very much about this session compared to many other sessions, uh, it is understated. It is profound in the way so, met, so much was said in a very understated way. And uh, I, I, I hope we'll have a lot more such sessions because we all need that quiet retreat to reflect on the blessings that we have that in a place like Singapore, we have come to take for granted. You know? And uh, I thank you, Alvin, for sharing us, sharing with us these little insights. And uh, I'm not sure whether you're aware, but in the National Day Rally last year, uh, Prime Minister Lee made a special mention of Alvin for his courage for going out there and quietly fighting causes. And I think today we can see what we mean, what he meant by quietly fighting causes. You see, there are people sometimes who believe in advocacy with aggression. But this man clearly advocates with quiet passion and conviction. And I think sometimes that wins the day. You know? And um, it's a privilege to make your acquaintance. And I think what is special about you is that you are normal. Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Elvin, we are very, very proud to have you as an alumnus. Yeah. Thank you. We have something for you, a gift. It's a small gift. It's a picture okay. taken of us, right? <laughs> and uh, I look better than you. Okay, we look very happy. <laughs> <laughs> we look very happy and we are happy. This is Elvin. And we've got one more thing for you to do. Elvin, uh, you can give, the, give that to us. This is for you to say something nice about us. Okay. <laughs> Must be something nice, of course.
you want to read it? Uh, to all the numerous folks at LUS, Obikatu, that means thank you in the tomb. Thank you. Thank you.